Welcome to course part 8 out of 11 Alloc Space Mission on Mission Control Center. Today uh, we're getting very very soon to the end of this course so I hope you're excited for this part too. Houston, we've had a problem here. You probably heard that voice before. Houston was actually Mission Control Center during the Apollo and Gemini mission. Um, the Mission Control Center is actually extremely extremely important in both space mission and analog space mission and surprisingly enough also for example in expeditions obviously the way they work is slightly different depending if you are in an analog space mission or space mission or in an expedition but they serve the same purpose basically they are a safety nets they have more information and they simplify massively the space mission without them there's no mission and there's no expedition. The Mission Control Center basically makes this link with Earth and all the specialists and has specialists inside the control center that help then the astronauts. As much as you want to train astronauts, they cannot have all the information they want and usually time is extremely critical. So the Mission Control Center has to take upon certain roles to help the astronauts. If you look at NASA's um, definition or in general, the Mission Control Center manages space flight from launch to landing, okay? So also during the space missions. Other aspects of the mission are monitored and it provides, for example, the flight plans or the schedule and it supports with the experiments and any kind of problems. So for example, if you've got a problem with your CO2 scrubber, they will try to see, okay, well, we've got the inventory of what parts we've got inside the space shuttle or the International Space Station or the Mir Space Station, we know we have this. Uh, we'll find a way to make a mock-up CO2 scrubber and then they tell the astronauts how to proceed. Um, they also have sometimes to abort the missions, they're the one who take the final decisions. They also have to know when you know an astronauts might have critical vitals because this information is sent back to Earth, to them, to what they have called a biomedical engineer. Okay. Uh, in the expedition, the MCC is basically in French, it's called Base Arrière, so um, back base. And it's basically the people who will check stuff like weather reports. So if you're going, for example, onto, to the pools and you've got extreme weather and you might have um, a storm, for example, where the temperature might drop massively, then you need those weather reports. And sometimes you're busy just moving and packing or it's, it's too cold for you to take out the computer, the computer freezes or something like that. So you might have a satellite phone that can send you just some very uh, coded and easy to receive um, notification about, for example, the weather. They also there in case you have an emergency. So normally you should be able to treat most of your wounds, but sometimes you cannot. Uh, so then in that case, they will be making contact with a medical doctor who can then let you know, okay, this is what you need to do. This is how you're going to do it. This is what you have in your toolkit. Use that. Okay. They also help in planning your, your expedition. So for example, if you were supposed to do a thousand kilometers, but halfway you encounter a certain problem, they could help you map out the rest of the route. Okay, so it's the kind of thing that you, you will find in expedition, but you also find in Mission Control Center. However, there's a little difference uh, between Mission Control Center and Analog Space Mission. Uh, the composition, though, for Analog Space Mission and Space Mission is usually quite similar because we're trying to make Analog Space Mission as, how do I say, realistic as possible okay so you've got capcom also earthcom that uh, depends you know which missions you're part of but it's basically the same role and that person is the, the person in the mcc who is in contact with the astronauts normally the astronauts don't hear the voice of anyone else but that person doing the mission okay they, they hear like capcom capcom is the link and in other space missions those capcoms actually trained analog astronauts so they do all the training with the others as if they were going to do the mission and then at the end uh, if you know the, the other pre-selected ones are accepted and they, they're not sick or they're not injured then that person stays on earth in a mission control center why is it important that they train like the other analog astronauts so that they understand the procedures they also understand the team dynamics and they're very close to them okay it's a, it's a friendly ear uh, voice in your ear okay uh, and then you've got the flight director that has really probably the toughest job in a way, not in the human kind of way, that's more the Capcom's role, 
but in the fact that they have the responsibility for the mission, okay? They oversee everything. They manage the, the flight controllers, okay? They should make sure that it's all operated safely. They lead the planning and coordination of all activities. So they don't make the flight plan. That's the flight planner's role, but they have to approve it. They have to approve any emergency procedures. They have to approve any kind of, of a big changes actually has to go through the flight director okay so it's an enormous responsibility because even in analog missions there's a little risk okay it's not as high as in space missions but you still often in isolation with a group of people who can get stressed and angry um, you can be in an extreme environment you might be doing an eva by i don't know like plus 40 degrees celsius so you still have a risk to manage and it's your responsibility to make sure that you make the right decision of uh, doing an, an abort, for example, or saying, OK, no EVA today, we, we're staying safe inside or we need to pull out the astronaut from the base. So it's, it's a very, very, very critical road. But to be fair, all those roles are actually extremely important. And as mentioned, the flight planner, for example, prepares a flight plan. Uh, we discussed this before, but a flight plan is is very crucial because it really optimizes your day. In analog missions, you could say, well, you know, without flight plan, you'd be doing experiment left and right. So the main consequence would be that you wouldn't be done with your experiments on time. Or for example, maybe an astronaut would say, well, I want to spend 15 hours a day working on this and they wouldn't spend any time on the cooking or doing sports. So they wouldn't be replicating well the, uh, the, the space mission, you know, because in space you would need to do sports. Otherwise you would be suffering massive cardiovascular debilitation. OK, so as much as you think, well, it's not important on Earth, actually for the purpose of the simulation, you need to admit to this. And also, if you don't do the cooking or the washing, then you're going to create tensions in, within your crew. It's your responsible ability, it's your responsibility to take care of everything and take care of everyone within your crew. Every crew member has to do the task. Everyone serves a purpose. You don't have one person cooking, you don't have one person cleaning. Everybody does it and it's put in the flight plan. OK, it also helps with the hierarchy that you don't have one person who does the fun stuff and one person who doesn't. Right. As much as it can be actually fun to clean and cook, you know, it's still usually you there mostly for the experiment side of things. Um, so the flight plan planner helps with this. So they, they design the flight plan for the mission, but they have to be extremely flexible because a lot of things do not go according to plan, uh, like life, but even more in analog mission or space mission because a lot of stuff takes way more time than we think, even when we anticipate, uh, you know, an, an extra time for it, because sometimes it's, it's the first time for the people going in the base. OK, so it might take a few hours to get used, for example, the donning and doffing. Uh, I think it was the example of the Austrian Space Forum. Uh, the first few times they do it, it takes them three hours to put on the spacesuit. After a couple of, of days or EVAs, they actually take about two hours. Still a lot of time, but you can see that there's a 33% change in the duration of the donning and, you know, doffing. Um, just, just all that they've done the training, okay? It's just within the mission. So the flight plan has to know this and they have to really adapt. And sometimes an experiment takes way less time. I mean, maybe they, they rehearsed it so well during the, um, in the lab before doing the training that they actually realized actually we can do it blindfolded and it took us only 20 minutes or the conditions were different and this is what happened. And when they have this extra time, then the flight planner has to think, OK, do we use it as downtime or do we shift it and use it for something else? For example, more time for the donning or more time for cooking. Uh, they have to adapt all the time and they communicate this flight plan. And the flight plan is also very, very interesting because uh, you would think it's it's annoying to get orders, but actually really, really makes your life easier to so have all the tasks like this. You don't have to think when do I do this, when do I do that? No, you just have to do it. You go, you do it. You have somebody helping you out. And that's the mission control center. OK, uh, for example, when you're doing an experiment and you're not sure about something, you actually call Capcom and you say, OK, um, I'm having a problem with that experiment that I'm doing right now that is in the flight plan, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it's problem there. So procedures, which is another role and the mission control center has all the procedures available. And basically Capcom will tell you stand by two and will talk to procedures, ask the question. If procedures does not find 
the information, then they will contact, contact, he will contact the PI. The PI is the principal investigator, and that person will, will have devised the experiment that the astronaut is working on, and they will then answer the question. The question will then be relayed back to the mission control center, he will relay it back to the astronaut. Okay, uh, the PIs are supposed to be on standby during the mission. They know normally which days the mission, the experiment is going to be run on. Sometimes the day shifts, so it's better if they have the whole month available for you know phone calls and stuff like this. Um, but basically, they need to be available because the experiments were not designed by the astronauts mostly, so they don't necessarily know when something goes wrong, where can they be adaptable, when can, can they modify something or not. They need the approval of the PI because otherwise they might fail completely the experiment, it might, it might become completely worthless, and then it's a waste of time, money, and also recognition for the mission. Okay. Uh, records is an interesting job too, it's basically they record anything that's going on in the base. Uh, there's obviously cameras, there's uh, vitals of the astronauts are often taken live depending on the analog mission, and space mission for example, uh, you've got cameras, recordings, so they know what's going and when, and that's that also helps in case you have an accident, in case you need to, also you have a conflict with a national, you can say, well, no, and this, this thing, this happened at that time, and we know, and, and that is a good way to both help in an interim standpoint, also understanding of the mission, when was there a problem, what can be improved time-wise, management-wise, um, organization-wise, uh, simply. Um, so yeah, still an important role. And obviously the biomedical engineer who's uh, on standby in case there's a medical problem, they can sometimes uh, have, um, for example, a logbook for the astronauts that only the biomedical engineer would read. Uh, it's not an intimate book, it's more like saying, oh, I feel like this today, I feel like that, I feel like that. And if there's anything that's actually worrisome in it, then they can talk to, for example, flight director and say, well, there's a, something going on with that astronaut or there's this conflict going on within the team and we should talk about it. Or you can then talk to the commander that's actually in the base and say, look, we need to solve that problem, blah, blah, blah. Normally, it's just quite confidential. You know, it, it's, it's just a way to take the, the heat out or just talk about the day, you know, saying I, I love the mission, blah, blah. But um, this notebook can be very useful to a biomedical engineer. A biomedical engineer might ask also the astronauts inside the base to do um, measurements every day, like blood pressure, temperature, you know, just general fatigue measurements also, and they can assess the well-being of the crew. And obviously, they also are on standby doing EVAs. Uh, EVAs are probably the most dangerous part of the analog mission because that's when you go outside. You might trip on a rock, it might get very warm, very cold. And you also have some medical team which is not inside the mission control center but is contactable, reachable by the biomedical engineer. Okay, so these are some of the main roles that you find in on a mission. Actually, on the photo here, this was doing the Asker Plus One mission. You can see this was the uh, flight director, one of the flight directors, uh, and you can see on the right, you can see the flight plan. Um, so they can see everything that's happening, and then the mission control center is all around. Uh, flight director ready uh, and they hear all the communication. So although Capcom is the only one that's normally talking to the astronauts, all the people in the mission control center hear what's going on. Okay. So next slide. Ah, so what's particular about analog space missions, MCCs? So you can see on the right that was actually me in the middle. Uh, you, you can see that was when we returned to Earth and we had um, kind of a yeah landing phase you know and in in space missions you obviously one of the most stressful parts of the mission is actually the takeoff and landing obviously a lot of things can go wrong you are sitting on a bomb and then you're returning with a plasma forming around <laughs> your spacecraft so those moments are extremely stressful not to mention that actually when you land there's actually a few minutes where due to the plasma forming there's no communication possible so the mission control center has no idea uh, where you are uh, when you're landing there and if you're actually alive okay so it's very very stressful on the mission itself it's, it's stressful but it's more day-to-day -day work sometimes there might be a solar flare or you know a, a foreign object impact but usually it's quite day-to-day -day routine you, you know what to expect you just it's more focused on the experiment and how the astronauts are feeling rather than you know is the rocket going to blow up or not right um in our space mission we don't 
have that problem really uh, because we're usually not that far even if you're in the desert or of say the arctic you might be like what half an hour one hour flight away but you're not actually sitting on a, on the bomb okay um obviously it's, it's still dangerous it's still dangerous you can still you know take a bus and then crash on the bus for us it was a I think it was a 15 minutes uh, drive to the way to the base, you know, so you've got 15 minutes drive. And then once you, once you get in the base, that's when the mission has officially begun on the moon or on Mars, depending which one you simulate it. But it's not really dangerous. Mission Control Center doesn't have much to do. They just need to check that you're in the base and that's they can see on the cameras. And that's when really the job starts. OK, but you can still simulate it. You can still pretend. Uh, put an airlock of the compression, etc., etc. Um, the focus is really mostly on the experiment and inside. It's it's a quite a big difference also from a flight plan. Um, when International Space Station, you have a lot of life support system, as we mentioned in the previous chapter. Uh, you obviously have the toilet that you have to maintain. You have to check that you've got enough oxygen, that the CO2 scrubber is working, that you have enough water, enough food. Yada yada yada. On Earth, in an analog space mission, you don't have that problem as much, okay? Uh, usually, the toilet systems is not as complicated. Uh, it might be just, you know, garbage disposal and that's it, kind of a filtration system. Your water is usually a store. It's rarely a filtration system because it's actually a bit more, uh, how do I say, advanced, a bit more costly, basically, to have these in the, in the mission. So usually, you've got a water tank. You know how much water you've got in it, and you measure and if you run out, okay, it's a problem, but you don't have to actually do any form of maintenance on that regard. Whereas on the space station, it can be, I don't know, between 30 and 50% of your time is actually on maintaining the toilet, maintaining the CO2 scrubber and checking that kind of thing. And if you don't do it, you die on Earth. If you don't do it, you open the door of the airlock and you get out and you eat some snow. Well, don't eat snow, it's not good for you, but you melt it before and you get your water, okay? So it's it's really quite different from the time that you can impart on experiments and maintenance if you compare analog space missions and space missions. Should we implement more life support systems? Yes, it would be great if you want to really add some simulation and some, some a more realistic aspect to analog space mission. However, the types of experiment we can perform is actually very, very interesting. So there's quite an advantage of having so much more time imparted for experiments uh, in analog space missions. But this is where the Mission Control Center must have a very, very tight contact with the principal investigators of those um, experiments, basically. Now, there's an interesting question. So, as I mentioned, the Mission Control Center is extremely, extremely important and necessary for space missions, expedition, etc. But once we're going to be on Mars, how is that going to change? The problem with Mars is the communication one way can take between four and 20 minutes. OK, which means if you want to say something and you're at the closest point of Earth and Mars, going to take you four minutes to say hi and four minutes for somebody else to say hello okay so you can't have a back and forth exchange so imagine there's something extremely dangerous happening uh what are you going to do are you going to wait eight minutes to give the information and it's not just eight minutes or 40 minutes depending where you are it can be way more because you might be saying okay we have a problem with the co2 scrubber and it's not working anymore we haven't found that part could you please give us this 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 instruction and mission control center has to listen to your message well receive it listen to the message and find a solution and communicate it clearly this is where analog missions are quite interesting is that we can work quite a bit on the clarity of communication. Uh, now more and more analog missions implement this time delay. Uh, Ashland Enterprises Agency puts eight minute delay. Uh, Ashland Space Forum, I think it's 10 minute delay. So one way, both. Another thing is four minute delay. So you have several missions who do this. They do get the vitals in real life. So they, they know they have the data, like the mission control centers knows exactly what's going on, but the communication itself is delayed, simulated delay. OK, uh, so it's quite interesting because you can really see how is the crew going to adapt if your personal reference before was always mission control center. But now it takes so much time to reply and give you the information then you're going to start relying more on yourself and your crew. 
this is where your training is going to need to be also more advanced, specifically, for example, in medical fields and base engineering, um, but also just in your your mental resilience. OK, you, you, you're you out there and you're mostly alone with your crew. OK, it's a uh, it's tough. But it's interesting because you can you can see how it already develops, it already changes in our missions. And you can also think about the mental health aspect. Um, a back and forth exchange is actually very important, like with your family and your friends. If you cannot have that and you cannot have that for like a year and a half, because that's how long it will take you to do a mission to Mars. How, how is that going to impact you? Are you going to miss them so much? Are you going to go crazy? Should you bring your family just to make sure that, you know, you're going to be OK? These are all things that are very important to to test and to, to look into. OK. Now, this is a set up example. Uh, this is for the Austrian Space Forum. So, for example, they have a mass habitat, they name it OPS, for example. And let's say they've got three different experiments. OK, they've got an experiment that's going on the EVA as a little astronaut, the experiment with a rover, and they've got an experiment that's going on in the base. And say they have a problem, well, they will contact the mission control center. It's going to take them 10 minutes. And then these are going to contact the different people who are responsible for those experiments. OK, so it is not going to be a direct exchange where um, they know everything. Right. Normally, if you don't know the information, you ask Capcom, Capcom ask procedures and they don't have the information. They're going to go further and ask the experiment specialists for experiment one, two, three, four, five, ten, whatever it is. But you have some different setups. For example, uh, you have on the right side, as well as Asco Plus One mission, you can actually see the media in it. It's quite important that your mission control center is accessible to media so that they can understand uh, what's going on. And you can see that in the left, that's the Austrian Space Forum. The Austrian Space Forum actually has a ground operation support team. Uh, this is something that we did not really have for Asco Plus. There was somebody who was responsible for the base because the base was rented out from another service, but it wasn't really a team that was trained and allocated for it. Okay, whereas uh, the Austrian Space Forum really trains a team. So the astronauts are actually not completely alone out there. Uh, they, they are in their habitat alone. They're the ones wearing the spacesuits, but there's like little Santa elves in the background that are there in case something happens, in case there's a you know, the, the base exterior has a, has a problem and they can't be repaired by the astronauts um, in case we need to, we need to bring some more resources, etc, etc. OK, so it's quite interesting to see that they have some differences between our space mission and they also have different denominations. So they've got, for example, they have a whole remote science support um, team, which is responsible for all the experiments, for example. And they have also an IT team, so really a communication and a media team. So they have really different kinds of, of how I say, work packages. Uh, it, it's very, very interesting to see the differences and also depends on, on your mission duration, your mission size, uh, how much budget you have. A lot of it is extremely uh, variable. However, the roles I presented before, these are uh, always there. Uh, so procedures, records, um, biomedical engineer, flight plan, uh, uh, flight director, uh, stay always, always there in Capcom, of course. Speaking of Capcom, um, really, I, I mentioned it before, but it's extremely important that you have somebody calm and friendly and that knows how to communicate. OK, um, if your Capcom is very stressful and bossy, annoying, um, it doesn't work well with the crew. Your crew is going to be tired. Mission control is probably going to be tired, especially in an analog space mission where it tends to be volunteers uh, that spend the holidays doing that. Uh, they have to do a night shift. Also, that's one thing. Like um, in the astronauts, they get to sleep at night. But mission control center, they have two to three shifts, Okay, which is why you need two to three of uh, each of the roles I mentioned before. And because they do the night shifts, some, some of them have to get up really early or get to bed really, really late and that can influence their mood. So as the mission goes on, you know, mission control center is going to get also a bit tired. OK, um, so the astronauts need to be friendly and the Capcom needs to be friendly and they need to know each other well. So that is really this kind of a team connection and trust. Also, um, if Capcom says something and the astronaut doesn't agree, they still have to obey. OK, they have to obey to mission control center unless they can see this immediate danger that Mission Control Center doesn't see. But like 99% of the time, 
Mission Control Center is right. Okay, so you just do what Mission Control Center does. And you just have to trust them. Why? Because they have access to all the books, they have access to all the PIs, they have access to all the media. They know what's going on on the rest of the mission. You are inside the base as the astronaut. You see the tunnel vision or a part of your experiment, the experiment didn't work or blah, blah, but you don't necessarily see the bigger picture because you don't have all the information. You trust Mission Control Center to give you that information. Uh, so Capcom is sometimes the, um, the first communication, like official work communication you have in the morning. Uh, you have the, the briefing in the morning, debrief in the evening, sometimes midday too. So it's a, it's a nice time. It's a nice moment we have this, this connection with, with Earth. If you have a direct communication, sometimes you have this delay. But still, it, it's a face that is outside of your crew. So it's nice. It's a relief, okay? So having somebody friendly who's like, good morning, how did you sleep? Everybody okay? Okay, let's go through the flight plan. You discuss things. Maybe you do a few jokes. It doesn't need to be always very tight. That's more when you, for example, have a... Uh, takeoff landing and when you have maybe a docking approach this is where you can't make jokes or you need to be fully focused but doing a mission especially an analog space mission you, uh, if you have this this kind of video back and forth exchange it can be quite friendly still it should be clear and should be straight to the point don't waste too much time but it's it's nice it's it's good for you okay so if you do select a good capcom uh, that makes you smile a little so, the communication protocols. Obviously, Mission Control Center does not work if you are not clear and you do not communicate clearly, okay? So be clear and brief. Don't be ambiguous. Don't say, hmm, maybe, or I don't know. We'll see, okay? None of this, okay? Communicate only what is necessary. Obviously, when you have a bit of time and you can make some jokes, sure, you can give a bit more. But for example, if you're doing an EVA or the time is very, very critical, don't spend time saying, oh, actually, what I ate today was a bit blue and I didn't really enjoy yet. This you can put in your logbook and later, okay? It's not necessary for Mission Control Center, okay? They busy, you busy, you have a mission to lead. Don't spend time talking about stuff that's not relevant to the mission, okay? Also, do not talk over people. Wait until they finish doing the message. Why? Because it can take really some time to get it right. Usually the audio is not necessarily that good, so you won't be able to hear them clearly. So if you talk above them, it's, they will have to restart the communication and you're going to waste time. Also, it's rude. So you wait until they're done and then you can leak it. Should be fairly obvious, but you know. Keep background noise to a minimum. That obviously, uh, again, if the person you're talking to cannot hear you well, you're going to have to repeat the instruction. And if there's a communication delay, Imagine how much time you're going to be wasting, okay? So check first, no noise, okay, we can go. And before you do any message, think, what do you want to communicate? Then you listen, see around, what's the situation, what is urgent to say, is there any noise, blah, blah. Check that you're talking to the right person, you're not contacting procedures when actually you need to contact, I don't know, Capcom, okay? You check that you're communicating to them or not talking to an astronaut inside the base, you're talking to MCC. Then you press, wait half a second, one second, and then speak. Why? There's something that we, you know, do as a mistake. It takes ages to get used to it. Uh, but even with a walkie-talkie or, you know, your computer, first press and wait a bit. Because if you talk right away, like at the same time as you press it, the first words might be cut, which means your message might be misunderstood. And again, you lose time. Okay, so make sure that you think about this, that you press, then you talk, that you thought about your message, thought about is there any noise, check that it's the right channel, be clear, not ambiguity, and only say what you need to say. Okay, when you haven't been talking to MCC for a bit and you want to get the attention, saying that you got a message, you don't say uh, MCC blah 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 blah. No, 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 you say. MCC for base, do you copy? You are base, you're calling MCC. MCC for base, do you copy? If they copy, they will say base, we copy. And then you say uh, ready to perform tasks from 800, for example. Okay, but don't, don't just talk right away. You need to get the attention. Why? Because maybe they're busy. Maybe they have media, maybe they have a problem with an experiment with another astronaut that's, you know, somewhere else in the base. Maybe they're talking to somebody else. 
if you just talk right away, the information will be missed. You will be frustrated. They will be frustrated and the mission will go nowhere. Okay. Some communication devices, you might have a satellite phone that's like emergency uh, Wi-Fi TeamSpeak. TeamSpeak works actually quite well. It's normally a gaming program or a gaming communication program, but works really, really well because you can really uh, identify different channels uh, and really say, well, I need that person there. So you can have uh, three or four computers used for the same or even more uh, on the same uh, program. So that it works really well. I think it's actually even a free program, so feel free to, to use that one. And walkie-talkie is also necessary for EVAs, for example, and also backup. Uh, so these are the kind of um, communication you can use. Obviously, you can look into different things, but these are the main uh, programs we'll use. An example of communication vocabulary, uh, copy means I copy and understand your message. Okay, You can also say Roger, which is more like acknowledge, but you know. Um, standby two means standby two minutes. So you wait for me. So for example, I say uh, MCC for base. Do you copy? Um, base we copy. Uh, could you please uh, check procedure uh, 1.56? And maybe Capcom is going to say uh, standby two. Maybe during those two minutes, uh, Capcom is actually going to check the procedure and say, okay, this 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 problem or this page is missing, whatever. Obviously, that wasn't clear enough. I should have said, could you check procedure missing question number five or blah, blah. But you express your problem and then they will ask for some time. They can also say standby. Maybe it's just it's going to be a few seconds or maybe it's going to be standby 10, standby 5, standby 3, whatever. They're going to tell you how much time it takes. Or they can also come back to you and standby 5 and it just adds up. OK, and you know they're going to come back to you. Negative for no, no is a bit too short. So for example, if I were to uh, press on the button and I say no, like this, they might only hear oh, because I cut the message and they might not be sure. But if I say negative, this, yeah, nothing sounds like negative, okay? They know negative is no, okay? Same way, if you want to say yes, say affirmative, then they know what it means. Will call means I will comply. It means I will follow your instructions. Um, means that you know you've heard, you understood, and you're just gonna go and go for it. And acknowledge is also let me know um, that you have understood. So it's like if I gave you an instruction, uh, for example, I tell the mission control center, um, could you please tell a BME, so biomedical engineer, that we have a problem with astronaut, blah blah blah. Um, could you please contact the reference uh, medical doctor and see what kind of medic medication we need for this 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 case acknowledge and then they let you they say uh i don't know affirmative or negative and then you know that they've understood or they do agree uh, or they do not agree okay um so yeah so these are some examples some missions have obviously different vocabulary will use some like for example acknowledge i've never used it personally i usually use do you copy and then you say yes i copy or copy um but it's yeah, it, it can just depend, but it's, it still works for one another. You just need to talk about it before what kind of vocabulary you want to use. There, so this was Mission Control Center. Uh, I hope that was useful to you. We're getting very, very close to the end, but hopefully you'll still be learning quite a few things. I'll see you next time.